I'm a mercenary. I'll make the arguments that are necessary to get what I think is the... <laughs> well, not a mercenary. I, I, I'm, I'm ruthless in pursuing <laughs> the leftist goal to where if you'll come on board for a reason that is not my reason, but is uh, enough to get you towards the goal, I'm okay with that. Um, but also, I just think you need to be careful to make sure that in an argument you know where you're going. You've mapped the thing out and, and you're prepared for the different eventualities that are going to come your way when you when you make a particular point. Yeah. So, I mean, back to this kind of, I like the framing of this hypothetical AOC yeah. MTG debate. Yeah. One of, the chap- <laughs> one of the chapters... Like Bernie Sanders, Ted Cruz. Did you watch Bernie Sanders oh, like, destroy Ted Cruz and Lindsey Graham? Oh, it's so satisfying. Absolutely. I'll give a qu- I'll quote from Bernie in the last debate because he was very explicit. This isn't about taxing the rich. What the Democrats want to do is tax the middle class. Here's what Bernie said. This is a quote. So, yes, to answer your question, Jake, if we can explain to people, yeah, you're going to be paying more in taxes. Now, he said it's going to be a progressive tax system. The wealthy are going to pay their fair share, not the middle class, not the working class, but everybody will pay some more. So. You're a single mom working, he says you're going to pay some more. You're a small business owner, he says you're going to pay some more. And the reason is there aren't enough millionaires and billionaires to pay for all the socialism that Bernie and the Democrats want to give away. This is why politics in America stinks. (laughs) Thank you. Because you, that's right, because you forgot (laughs) the other half of the sentence. And what the other half of that statement said is, yeah, you may pay more in taxes if you're in the middle class, for a Medicare for all single payer health care bill, but you're not going to have to pay your private premiums to an insurance company and you will be better off. Now, Ted stays up nights worrying that somebody's going to pay more in taxes. Apparently, you don't worry that there are families in America paying fifteen or twenty thousand dollars a year for insurance to private companies. Well, you know, Bernie, that's okay for you. Uh, you know, Bernie, I, I, I do worry about it. More. Yeah, well, and, you and, didn't and, get and, my whole point. But, but Obamacare point. caused that. My, no, Obamacare, Obamacare did not cause so, that. So, so Bernie, let, 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 a, a so, couple uh, of simple facts. But one more point. Let me Go just ahead. say, all right, and I'll give it back to you. Next time you quote me, give the whole quote. Not I read a whole paragraph. Well, the quote was I, wrong. I, I'm sorry part. I didn't read the whole speech. Well, you took out the essence but, of what okay, it was. But you're right. Look, this divide shows the difference between Democrats and Republicans. What Bernie wants to do is tax the living daylights out of you. Take all your money and then... Did I say and, that? Yes, you did. Oh, because you said that. we're going to tax the middle class. And then you said, but we, the Democrats, are going to give it back to you. We're going to give you free stuff. We're going to give you free health care. We're going to give you free... Uh, education. But you know what? It's going to be Bernie and Maria deciding what you get. Tim and I have a much simpler view. You get to keep your money. You decide if you want to spend it on bracing for your kid, if you want to invest it, your decision, not politicians. I want to bring this this back for one second to the corporate tax. quoting me, Jake. (laughs) What Bernie said is that the United States of America should join every other major country on earth and guarantee health care to all people. And when we do it, we're going to lower the cost of health care so, for the middle class. I would, I, would love, I, would, I would love to get this back. And, and one of the things, I mean, it, the, the, that debate in particular was so interesting because one of the things that I think neither uh, neither man was prepare, prepared for, especially Ted Cruz, who I believe is like a debate bro, Harvard Law, like actually did his homework to a certain degree, opened with a statement that seemed very confident. The thing that they, no one really predicts about Bernie, what makes Bernie have the advantage in those kind of circumstances is that unlike most Democrats, he doesn't feel the need to defend Democrats. So when Ted Cruz comes out with a litany of complaints about the ACA and how it's raised premium prices and how it has all of these problems, Bernie is like, yeah, I mean, it's got some issues. That's why we should do Medicare for all. And Ted Cruz was completely unprepared for that. Oh, yeah. That being said, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Nathan. Well, no, but what you're pointing out is this is conservatives doing the thing that we're advising leftists not to do, which is that they haven't familiarized themselves Mm -hmm. with the position of their opponent, so they're going to get blindsided by it. So conservatives, a lot of them, like, don't understand the difference between liberals and leftists. And actually, that's a huge advantage for leftists, Mm -hmm. because the moment the right comes out in a debate and goes, but Obama did this, and Pelosi did this, you go, yeah, I hate those people. 
Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And then and then they have nothing. You're like, that's not me. I oppose that. Look at all these articles I've written about this. I think Joe Biden is an absolutely terrible president. So nothing that you've said has any bearing on the point I've just made. Right? Absolutely. And, so get- <laughs> and by the way, I've debated a number of leftists who also seem not to have ch- chosen to familiarize themselves with a single thing that I've said. And that has also <laughs> gone not right. so well for me. So, yes. <laughs> like, like you, you know, actually, I interviewed Vosh once and he told me that he doesn't prepare for debates. Yeah. And he, he said this explicitly. He said, I don't prepare for debate. And, um, you know, he does pretty well for a guy who doesn't prepare generally. But I prepare by reading every word that person has written, compiling a dossier that has the quote every time. Because if I accuse them of having said something and they say, I've never said that, I want to be able to read it, cite where it came from. Uh, you, you, you know, the more you prepare, the better you'll do. <laughs> that's, I mean, I think that's the lawyer in you also. I mean, yes, we, are, we have to be prepared to impeach <laughs> the person. And I don't know why people don't think that that's, uh, see that as the important tool that it is. I remember when I was, um, well, it wasn't even a debate. It was a friendly conversation at the time uh, with Sam Cedar about force the vote. You know, I had been in the position of having to engage with any number of people's anti-force the vote um, arguments. I talk to everybody. I had talked to Natalie Schur and Ben Burgess about it on the Katie Halper show. I had, you know, written an article about it in Current Affairs. A lot of people over at Current Affairs, you know, Current Affairs didn't necessarily agree with me and be a pro force of vote at the time. But in the process of editing my piece, like people changed their minds. Like I, I had talked to everybody I could, listen to all of the counter arguments, adjusted my own argument right? In response to some good faith criticisms like from David Sirota, who were concerned about other asks. So by the time I got to Sam Cedar, a month or so after the deadline for force to vote, I knew not only what he had said, but or what his arguments were going to be, but what the vulnerability of his mm-hmm. argument was going to be, which is that from my perspective, it seemed that as long as there were all these upsides and very limited downsides, there was no reason not to try it. And so I had to attack his perception that there were these big downsides. So the whole argument really hinged on large part on whether or not he was correct about Kevin McCarthy potentially becoming Speaker of the House if this were tried. And once it became clear that even a month after Force the Vote, he was still parroting that wrong talking point. And once I got we I got him to say that and then we rebutted it on the podcast, to me, the whole debate was over. But he like clearly didn't see it that way because he had not engaged with not only anything I had said, but it was apparently with anything any of the other Force the Vote advocates had been saying for the past couple of months. And, and look at all the people who come at you on this with, well, this is why a Medicare for all floor vote is not the correct ask. And they think that's the argument against force the vote. And and then all you go is, OK, but we agree on the tactic. Right. Right. And then the and then. Because they, they thought that that would be a knockdown talking point. They thought that we would just stay on the on the turf of whether the correct ask was the Medicare for all floor vote. Um, nobody's prepared to deal with the, yeah, but okay, but can we at least agree that we should use the speaker vote as a right. form of leverage to extract as many demands as possible and that the only debate we should be having right now is what those demands should be, which I am perfectly happy to discuss with you so long as we agree that this is the correct tactic and that what we need to do is get as much as we can. Right. And at that point, <laughs> then it becomes, OK, but, but Jimmy Dore just didn't like Jimmy Dore. So we all know how that goes. But what you were saying earlier, I want to go back to this um, sure. uh, AOC, Marjorie Taylor Greene, <laughs> Yeah. While Bernie Sanders doesn't have to defend the Democratic Party and often declines to do so, Mm. AOC, at least in recent years, has taken a different kind of approach. And I wonder if that would hamstring her meaningfully in the context of a debate with Marjorie Taylor Greene and partly maybe why she doesn't want to do it, because she has tied herself to the Democratic Party in these notable ways. When the force of vote moment was happening just a month or so ago, uh, on the Republican side of the aisle, the squad members, progressives demonstrated more solidarity with Hakeem Jeffries than they ever have, <laughs> frankly, since they got oh elected with the left electorate that put them into office. They were making a big public show of how devoted they were to Hakeem Jeffries, despite him having devoted his career uh, starting super PACs, et cetera, to try to prevent progressives from getting into Congress. 
Um, and it puts her in the position, frankly, the you know, the fence of Joe Biden saying that she wouldn't back a Democrat, you know, a, a left challenger kind of being evasive on those kinds of questions puts her in a position, frankly, of having to do what Bernie didn't in that debate. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, that being the case, one, is she right to not want to be to not want to expose herself to a Marjorie Taylor Greene tee off? Or do you see a way around that for her? Well, she's she's right conditional on it being non-negotiable for her to have to defend the Democratic Party, because it's true that if you are going to do that, it's going to it opens up a real severe vulnerability to you in a debate, because the moment you try and make a point about money and politics, uh, they'll go, well, look at all these these terrible things the Democrats have done. And you will again be left with your with your mouth flapping open like ah but, but, but well you know if you you want it so that if someone says but Obama did this you say I you are able to say like Bernie on uh, Social Security with Obama yeah I fought him on that at the mm -hmm. time I was strongly opposed to it look at my record um, and so yes I do think that AOC's failure to you know, really assert her independence, even though she said things like Joe Biden and I don't really belong in the same political party, which mm -hmm. I always like it when she says that. Mm -hmm. um, but then she won't come out and criticize the party leadership. Well, if you won't come out and criticize the party leadership, you are going to end up looking evasive and looking like you have something to hide when you have made it your job to never publicly criticize their sins. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that being said, I not because I think it's a good thing, but because I, I think from her political perspective, like if I, there's what I, would, I want to happen and there's what I would do if I were a paid member of her team. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if I were a paid member of her team, I would tell her absolutely not to debate Marjorie Taylor really? Greene. What's that? Yes. Because I, I think she has more to lose than she has to get. I don't think that she is willing to do the things that she needs to do to win. Okay, yeah. I mean, I'd say do it. I, if I was on her team, I'd say, look, this is a really great opportunity if we prepare for this for a month and we do drills and we know going into it, there's the, there may be more to lose than there is to gain, but we know we're getting the gain. We're not going in there with risk because we've eliminated the risk. I feel that way about debate. I try not to do public... I mean, actually, no, I accept most invitations to public debates, but I, if I, and I've only done a few because I don't get invited to public debates for as much as huh. I expect to be. Uh, it's really weird. Well, people like Shapiro and Peterson don't want to do it. So uh, I, I, I don't know. I would do public debates, but the thing is, I actually kind of hate agreeing to do public debates because I want to go in with almost no risk that I'm going to be humiliated, that I'm at least going to do fine because I'm well prepared enough. So yes, I would advise her against it if she's just going to show up. <laughs> if I hypothetically have gotten an invitation from Shapiro, do you think I should do it? Um, yes, but you should let me prep you. <laughs> I was going to ask. Okay, so let's take AST out of this. What would be our first hour of Ben Shapiro prep? Um, we would try and map out all of the things that he can get you on. We would we would approach it adversarially, right? So one of my problems with I like Anna Kasparian. She, she, she's a fantastic, fantastic debater. I think she's one of the best we have on the left. Um, but she was a little conciliatory with Shapiro. Mm -hmm. And my approach to Shapiro would be that you want to embarrass and humiliate him and make him look so stupid that no one ever wants to listen to him again. <laughs> well, <'Cause> let's, <laughs> so, to, I'm curious about that, um, Nathan, because at some point in your book, you say, you know, you want to you want to come off as like appealing, not like a woke scold, not like yeah, yeah, yeah. a humorless scold no, no. to the audience. So do, do is there a trade off there between... Because this also came up recently in um, because uh, uh, Crystal Ball and Sagar and Jetty were on Joe Rogan's podcast and they were talking about important issues with respect to Ilhan Omar being kicked off her committee seat because of alleged anti-Semitic remarks. And then Joe Rogan, in the midst of what was an important conversation about how what Ilhan said was not actually anti-Semitism, does a little anti-Semitism of his own, which kind of confuses the issue. He's like, you can't say that Jews don't love money. They love money. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh so God. people, people, there's been this like debate on the left about whether or not, you know, Crystal and Sager should have pushed back more. You know, um, what's his face? Uh, the congressman comes out and accuses yeah. Crystal and Sager of being anti-Semitic and people are taking cheap shots. But I mean, this is the trade-off where in the moment, in the moment, you know, having to deflect and reorient things like that without alienating the audience 
is a challenge for sure. You don't have to alienate the audience. I, I'm confident that both you or I could both appear charming and make Ben Shapiro appear stupid at the same time. I, I mean, yes, you don't want to be a, a scold, but I think it is possible to strongly disagree with someone without making everything. I mean, you make everything. And look, if someone says, oh, Jews love money, it's an awkward moment. So you have a choice to either like try and paper over the awkwardness by saying nothing, like let's end this awkward moment as much, or you go, yeah, that's a little bit, that's a bit of an anti-Semitism there. And maybe Joe Rogan's mad, but I actually think that that would be the correct, I would hope that I would have, I would say that. I'm not saying, look, it's a really difficult thing. And I understand that like, it was just an uncomfortable moment for Crystal and Tiger when someone busts that out on you. Sometimes you don't act the way that in retrospect, you're like, shit, I should have, I should have gone sure. like, yeah, I'm not signing on to that. <laughs> in yeah. fact, I feel like you could just go, yeah, I'm not going to sign on to that one. Like, <laughs> yeah, and that, I mean, I think that's a version of what Crystal ultimately did. She says, yeah, well, and pivots hard to getting back to what I said. I defend what I, I'm saying about Ilhan Omar's, you know, you know, criticism of lobbying groups as not being anti-Semitic. And and I, you know, I, I understand yeah. the pushback. I talked at length with Katie actually about it on an episode of her show. So people can go and listen to that um, if they want to know my full thoughts about how to handle that sort of issue. But I, I agree with you, Nathan, that there there definitely is a way to push back without seeming like a humorless scold. But I will also acknowledge that it is a very difficult dance. It takes a lot mm. of emotional intelligence. That isn't yeah. necessarily the kind of thing that deba debate bros are selecting for, or the political world is necessarily selecting for. Yeah, look, I mean, if you want to criticize uh, Crystal for that, um, Let's see how, let's let's rewind your last conversations when someone, you know, any given person, like when, when was the last time that someone said something that was, you know, made you uncomfortable? Some people are good at going, that's problematic. You're an asshole. You know, some people are good at that. Some people want to, want to you know, we don't want to be rude. It, it's difficult. It's difficult. Okay. I would like to think that in that situation, I would go, Joe, you really, really, that's not, that's not a thing you should say. That's, ooh, no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, and or maybe more importantly, to to make, to to use the moment to illustrate the difference between, I mean, th what Joe said is exactly what everyone's accusing Ilhan Omar yeah, exactly. of saying. So to use yeah, that like, as a moment to say, well, well, you're literally saying Jewish people love money. Yes. Ilhan Omar was saying right. this lobbying group is doing what lobbying groups do, which is to use money to influence policy, this in this case, in the interest of the Israeli government. So these are not the same thing. But I t completely take your point about like, if you actually put a camera on me, I think I've talked about this, if not on this show, then on my Colin show, how like when I'm in these Uber conversations that I'm always in, people say all kinds of wild stuff. And I'm picking and choosing whether or not I'm going to stop and go on this frolic and detour about some weird sexist or anti-gay or whatever thing that someone has just thrown into the mix or whether I'm trying to trying to land my point to get them to consider the economic left populace next time they're on the ballot. And I, I got to say, if you play back, I make different choices in different contexts, depending on how extreme the thing that was said was and how much I can live with it. But honestly, my, my, my decision making in private <laughs> is very different than my decision making in public. And I don't know, people can make moral judgments about that, but that's real. It's true. I, I mean, you know, when Burgess went on Rogan, he had to kind of think, he, he, he said afterwards, he had to think like, which things do I challenge? Yeah. Which things do I not? Because I can't fight him every time he's, uh, every time, if you have fought Joe Rogan, every time Joe Rogan said a dumb thing, like, I'm sorry, but Joe Rogan's mouth is just a dumb opinion machine. So you've got to be very selective and go, what am I going to, what am I going to argue with here? What am I going to let pass? What am I going to just Well, that, that may be true, Nathan, but I would also come back to your book for a second because you have this great chapter <laughs> where you <laughs> illustrate all the ways that because Joe Rogan asks better follow-up questions than the average interviewer, the average journalist, he has had some epic takedowns of folks oh, like know. Candace Owens. I know. I know. <laughs> Here's the crazy thing about Joe Rogan, okay? Joe Rogan's opinions can be just idiotic. But Joe Rogan is like Socrates, okay? Because Socrates <laughs> doesn't know anything, but he knows the questions to ask of other people who pretend to know things but don't know things. And sometimes Joe Rogan's a terrible questioner. He lets people get away with, with just like, I mean, Alex Jones and the aliens, like four hours of like, this is why aliens are real. Okay. He had a guy on who believes he's found Atlantis, and I would have liked to see some critical, more critical questioning <laughs> of the man. But then you watch Joe Rogan and like uh, Dan, Dan Crenshaw, Joe Rogan and Candace Owens. 
Ken is someone he wouldn't let it go. She was like, I uh I don't think climate change is real. And he's like, but you don't you don't know anything. He's like, you don't know anything about the science. And she's like, yeah, but I just don't, I just don't think it's real. And he stays the reason the thing he does that a lot of people in the media don't do is he stays on it. He's like, then your opinion is not an informed opinion. He's yeah. like, you're believing the minority of scientists over the majority, but you don't have a good reason for choosing the one group over the other group other than ID, other than it fits with your ideology. And I'm watching this going, man, that's, a, that's, that's some insight from Joe. He has flashes of brilliance, I have to say. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I, I loved reading you. You include the whole back and forth whole in your book. Because it's incredible. <laughs> and we should put, we should clip that section of their conversation in the episode here. I fell victim to the idea that like it was progress. It was progress. It was progress. We have to care about the environment. It was progress. And it's like, no, like we've been losing. America has been losing. And Donald Trump understood that in, in a way that I didn't. And you don't I thought think we have to care about the environment. Like we no, no, not even a little bit. Like, no. Not even a little bit. No. Do you, um, OK, let me let me clarify this. I don't throw trash on the ground. Like okay. I'm, I'm not saying like we need to like, you know, trash the environment. Like, um, but do I believe in climate change? No. You don't believe in climate change. Well, I think the climate always changes, I guess is what I should say. Do I believe that this is like, you know, an issue that um, is being that, that is fa global warming, which they've changed conveniently. They got rid of the word once scientists started disproving it. Now they only say cli climate change. Um, no, I, I think that that was just a way to extract dollars from Americans. I don't at all believe they had no actionable plan. It was great for Trump to get out of that deal. It was terrible. OK, but this is an incredibly complicated subject. Right. And if you would have to talk to a bunch of different scientists right. and see how they gather data and see what they understand about CO2 levels and what's the danger of them right. and what can combat it and what could not. Have you done all this or no, do you so take think, this flippant opinion no, it's, based it's, on listen, the I'm party not, line? This, is not, this wouldn't be the hill I died on, right? But it's not about the party I just genuinely, I, I've read a ton about it, but what I would not read? be able to, I would not be able to come to you and say like, this is my strong opinion, but here's like the easiest way to say this, right? Okay. The fact that there is a disparity in the science community about whether or not it's real is enough to- it's very little, yep. very little disparity. But, most, most, dis most scientists, most, the, the vast majority, agree that human beings are negatively affecting climate change. Yeah. The vast majority. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, just, I just don't think so. You, so you think that the very few scientists that disagree with yeah. the consensus are the ones that are correct. In 2014, the vast majority, 87% of scientists, said that human activity is driving global warming, yet only half the American public, public ascribed to that view. So well, what website is 87%, this? and this is... Scientific American. Yeah. Yeah, dot .com, though. Like, cause it, that, that means it's, it's making money. I don't trust that. If it was a dot .org, I would probably take that, but that, this is just a random website, and well, I, I don't Well, Scientific trust American is not necessarily a random website it's yeah i don't i don't believe this like at all just so you know you don't believe it like at all <laughs> I, I genuinely <laughs> i genuinely don't believe it. i know you do but i genuinely well, don't believe it i like, believe most of the time the consensus of scientists that are studying the data right and so what they're doing is but study do you remember all of the stories that came out about the scientists that said that when they tried to present their evidence to show like they were basically just getting shut down at every corner you can pull that up too like scientists who like, look up i guess look up the opposite Right. Instead of instead of looking for what but you're searching minute, for, looking why? for what you're not looking that's for. Not what I, I didn't search for it. That's what I found when I searched oh. it. Sorry. Yeah. But yeah. Look up. But, like, but look this up. is my question. Yeah. Why are you so sure? This is a no. Extremely, because what you just said. Because what you just said. This is an extremely yeah. complicated subject. I, and it is. I'm. I'm. I'm I, I said. I am not so sure that I would die on the hill for it. The one thing you always find with me is I'll never pretend to be so educated on something. Like, I'm, I'm not going on college campuses talking about global warming. I don't do that. Right, but why right? are you saying that you don't I, think I just, it exists, I just, don't, I just, I don't know. Maybe because it got Here so... It maybe Studies, because it got so politicized. Uh, Studies into scientific agreement on human-caused global warming. And look at all the studies. It's between... 100% and 91% at the lowest, 91% yeah. of one of the studies from 2014. This is the Union of Concerned Scientists. Yeah. Org. They almost, it's it's a pretty broad right. consensus. Who do they, yeah, who, do, who are they um, polling? Is it the people Scientists? that are a part of this dot, <laughs> um, dot, this dot org? That's what I'm asking. 10,306 be... scientists to confirm over 97% of climate scientists agree, and over 97% of the scientific articles yeah. find that global warming is real and largely caused by humans. Right. So my question to you is, if you want to step outside of the scientific consensus, right. which is vast and involves 10,306 scientists, 
and just say, I don't believe in it. Yeah. Even if you're right, even if you're right, you don't have enough information to say that. Right. No, you and, might but, be I, correct, but that's what I said. That, that, that's just the but whole you're point. saying I, you don't believe I it. I don't. Yeah. I, I would have to have someone sit down and convince me that it was real. I personally but, don't believe it. That's okay. But why? It's, it's good but, to start at a place of not believing something. But, no, it's not. You think you should start with believing everything. No, it's not believe either or. Not believe yes, not believe no. Yeah. But don't say you don't believe. Yeah. I, Learn about it. Yeah. Learn about it and then have an opinion. But you're stating this opinion without having any real understanding of right. what climate well, science yeah, cause, cause is. It's, but that's that's exactly what an opinion is. I'm not going, like I said, if if, if you said that, Candace, you went on to 10,000 college campuses and you said that global warming wasn't real, then we'd have a problem. Mm -hmm. You and I are just having a conversation. But if you and I are having a discussion, sorry, I don't believe in it. Like, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I, I would say open, open again. to learning. Okay. Open to learning. Okay. I'm always open to learning. I've I've been wrong before. I was a liberal two years ago, you know, um, or three years ago. So that's that's not a problem. I'm open to learning, but I'm not gonna like pretend like say something that feels inauthentic. And what I wanted to say there was I don't believe in it because I think your point about him being like Socrates is such an important one. I think so much the belief so so many people like when you're in this position of being a pundit, a political commentator, you know, a podcast host, there is this weird in-between zone that you occupy as someone who's supposed to know the things versus someone who's supposed to be inquisitive. And I think that there's a lot of pressure, especially in, I think, some kind of lefty, elite kind of podcasty radio show NPR culture, that there's an expectation that you already know everything and it's embarrassing mm. to disclose that you're asking a question. Like, you're supposed to read the person's book beforehand and only be asking questions performatively to, like, walk the the interview subject down the path of, you know, you know, explaining themselves in the way that you think they should explain themselves. But the reality is, I think that some of the best interviews come from people who are like, I'm genuinely confused by what you say, or I've disagreed with something that you said. Can can we go, can we, do we, can we debate it? Can we discuss it? I have, yeah. I have, I have a kind of theory lately that almost the dumber you are, the better an interviewer you are. Not it, dumber in some sense, you, you got to be kind of curious, or but not ignorant. know anything. The more yes. ignorant you are. Yeah, in fact, uh, you know, because I, I, I do interviews on the Code Affairs podcast every week and I've learned to be naive. I've learned every time I have a stupid question to ask the stupid question. Um, it's why, it's one reason Joe Rogan's a good interviewer. It's one reason Lex Friedman is a really good interviewer because he doesn't really know very much about a lot of things, but he like wants to know stuff. And the, yeah. you, the audience, you want someone who's your ambassador as an interviewer, and they're relatable because they don't know a thing, you don't know anything, and they're like you sitting there with the person asking the, you know, taking the embarrassment for you of knowing nothing. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, when I first started this podcast, I would, I would read, I would, I was, first of all, I had less on my plate. I only had one job. I have three now, but I would always read every word of every book of someone who would come on. I would Google all their most recent articles. I would read the last, like, week or two of their Twitter thread. Like I was yeah. obsessively prepared. And what I found is that sometimes it would make me a worse listener, less willing to go off the track, you know, follow up with something that they had said because I was so married to the notes and the questions I had already asked. It would make me ask more long-winded questions um, because I was kind of performing knowledge of what they had already right. written. Um, yeah. And as I've gotten more comfortable with this job, and I'm more confident in my interview skills. I, I I have stepped away from that. And it's only been to the benefit of the podcast. No, it's, it's true. And, and the other thing that is a pitfall is that you can end up, because you've read their work and they mm -hmm. know their work, you like have a high level conversation between two people who are like using the same references. Like this is two people who've read a book that the audience hasn't read. And so the you're entering this private world between these two people who have this deep knowledge of this book and the audience doesn't have the knowledge so it's less relatable. So yeah. the less you you have to you have to keep in mind when you're speaking for an audience and not going for a coffee with someone just to talk to them uh that you know you want the audience to understand where your where your questions are coming yeah. from. <laughs>